Hi, this week we're speaking to Dr. Hendrix on his recent paper on Spinosaurus, which was pu uh, published in PLOS One. So Dr. Hendrix, could you give us a quick summary of your work? Yes, yeah, certainly. So first of all, thanks for having me and thanks for in your interest in, in my research. So, so basically with my co-authors, Octavio Mateusz and, and Eric Bufto, we just try to describe and identify six bones from the Cretaceous of Morocco. So those bones were identified as being a quadrate. So it's only one bone. Six of them really are quadrates. So what is a quadrate? A quadrate is in birds, reptiles, and dinosaurs. It's a bone located in the back of the skull that articulates with the low jaw. So it's an important uh, bone regarding the articulation with the lower jaw and the jaw mechanism. It's interesting actually to say that in mammals, it's a bone that migrated in the middle year throughout the evolution of mammals and became the incus. And so those six bones were found, found in a region called the Kem Kem, in the Kem Kem Bats, which is a region southeastern Morocco that has yielded a huge amount of dinosaur bones and especially theropod bones. So theropods are those meat-eating dinosaurs that gave rise to birds. People have to know that birds are dinosaurs, they are theropod dinosaurs. And so there is a very large diversity of uh, theropods in this environment. It's a, a site that is dated 100 million years ago. We are in the Cretaceous. It's a period of time where there were gigantic dinosaurs in South America, in North America, like Carcharodontosaurus, Gigantosaurus for South America. People might know those names because it's really, they represent the largest meat-eating dinosaurs. And actually those six bones were um, identified as be being uh, quadrates, but they were also uh, identified as uh, becoming, belonging, sorry, to spinosaurs. And spinosaurs are those very weird uh, meat-eating dinosaurs that were bipedal, but they had a very crocodile-like skull. So they had uh, an elongated snout, they had conical teeth, they had retracted nares. And we believe actually that all those adaptations, all those, uh, this morphology of the skull is really uh, linked to uh, piscivory. So they obviously had uh, a fish-eating diet. But so uh, we do actually have some direct evidence in spinosaurids showing us that they were feeding on fish, but it seems also they were feeding on other dinosaurs and, and uh, pterosaurs, those flying reptiles. And so just based on those six bones, what we could say is that they belong to spinosaur, but they belong to two species of spinosaurs because we have two morphotypes, two, two different morphologies among those bones. And what it tells us is obviously there were two spinosaur species living in the Kem Kem environment. And we believe actually that they were living, most likely uh, they were coexisting. So they were living at the same time in this environment. And it's interesting it's actually because uh, there was a study uh, one year ago that uh, was published uh, in a very important paper that was uh, a couple of scientists, international scientists, leading author and Israel Ibrahim was saying actually that all the bones belonging to spinosaurs in the Kem Kem in North uh, Africa during that time only belong to one species. And so the first thing in this paper is that we discredit that. We say no. Obviously, there were two species of spinosaurs, spinosaurus most likely, and another one that was that is called Sigil Massasaurus, Sigil Massasaurus. We don't know much about the anatomy. We only have like uh, the backbones, the, the, the vertebrae. But so we actually said that there were obviously two species of spinosaurs in the Kem Kem 100 million years ago. Um, so in North uh, Africa. The second thing is that what's great with those six bones is like we have actually tiny bones and very large ones. So obviously the very tiny one belongs to a juvenile and the very large one belongs to a fully mature animal. So we can investigate what we call in uh, paleontology in uh, science ontogeny which is actually the development of the organism. So we can say actually based on those six bones, some belonging to juveniles, some belonging to immature animals, and some belonging to uh, very uh, subadult or adult, fully adult animals, we can see actually the change in the morphology of this bone throughout the life of those spinosaurs. So it's quite interesting. And the third thing that is quite important in this paper is that we investigate what we call more, the morphofunctional analysis of 
the uh, jaw articulation. So what does that mean is that we have those quadrates. We know that they articulate with the lower jaw. They have a certain morphology of the articulation between the, the, the so the, the quadrate and the, the, the jaw, so the, the articulation between the quadrate and the jaw. And so we, 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 we see that actually there is a strange mechanism because there is a groove that is not exactly, uh, that doesn't follow the long axis of the skull, but is diagonally oriented, which means actually that when the jaw, the mandible was depressed, when the, the animal was opening the mouth, well, you had a lateral displacement of the two parts of the mandible that we call rami, the left and right part of the mandible. And so what it means is that when the animal was opening the mouth, obviously his mouth, his pharynx was widened. And so we understand that actually this animal had the, uh, the capacity, the possibility of swallowing large prey thanks to that, which makes sense actually, because we know that those animals, the spinosaurs that was that were living there, were very large animals. We know that they were like more than 16 meters in length, with a skull of more than 1.5 meters, which is enormous. And so those animals were obviously feeding all the time, trying to to feed themselves because they were such big animals. But also because we know that spinosaurs were most likely piscivorous animals. They were feeding on fish. We believe actually they were able to swallow large, very large fish. And indeed in the Kem Kem environments, we see that there are very large fish uh, living during that time, like silicon-like fish. And so spinosaurs were obviously able to swallow them entirely as a whole. So that's something also important. And we also know that because when we see the um, the articulation between the two parts of the mandible, the left and, and right part of the mandible, well, there is a, a very loose articulation. It's a movable articulation. And so we believe actually that so those spinosaurs were able to swallow large prey. And when we see actually that some living animals do the same uh, currently, the, those animals are the pelicans. And pelicans are fish eaters, and they also are able to swallow large fish fish because then when they open their mouth, their jaw is also widened, their mouth is also widened uh, the same way as spinosaurs. So it's a very interesting uh, conversion between two animals that belong to the same group, theropods, but of course pelicans are very derived theropods, spinosaurs are basal ones, but two animals that are feeding on fish and we're obviously feeding probably the same way. And so this really, the conclusion of this paper is that based only on one bone, six specimens of only one bone, you can extract a huge amount of information. Sorry. You can say, you can talk about the size of the animal. You can say, you can uh, give information about the diversity. We are saying that there are two species, obviously. You can uh, give information regarding the ontogeny, like the development of the individual. And you can also... Uh, give information regarding uh, the biomechanics, the ecology of the animal, you know, like how the jaw was moving when the animal was uh, opening the mouth. So we published all of this and in, uh, so far it has been well, uh, uh, what do you it? Well, receptive, uh, I don't know if you said it, but anyway. And so we're quite excited about it because uh, it's it's an interesting uh, study and, and, and yeah, it's like, People often criticize the fact that, oh, you're only uh, describing uh, just one bone, but, but my God, you can, you can provide a huge, huge amount of information about this. So here we go. That was fascinating. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that they were, they were eating um, fish and they were also eating um, other dinosaurs that were around. Um, were they the top predator in the, the Kem Kem Valley or have larger, um, maybe something that was eating them also been found? No, I don't believe so. They were a very large theropod dinosaurs living at the same time, such as Carcharodontosaurus, which is a very large animal. But the 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 the, the ecology of this animal was different because it's it's an animal that really looks like a T. Rex. So it was a super predator feeding mostly on uh, on dinosaurs, perhaps crocodiles. So it was not a fish eater. But Spinosaurus, as I said, was actually a very large animal, one of the largest, if not the largest terrestrial predator that has lived on Earth. So it was definitely those two species, actually, Spinosaurus, were definitely on the top of uh, the, the food chain. They didn't have any predator. 
they were most likely spending a lot of their time in water because we believe we have some evidence that they were semi-aquatic animals. They were spending a, a very long time in water, but they may have been also terrestrial. They, they, they were spending also some time in land. And so, yeah, they were really on the top of the true food chain, uh, feeding on a lot of different things like dinosaurs, crocodiles, perhaps, but uh, pterosaurs, as I say, and certainly, most likely, majoritarily, uh, fishes, fish. That's really interesting. Um, another question, I'm just wondering how you, you worked out about how the mandible moved and um, what methods yeah. were, like, were you using morphometrics and um, basically how did you work that out? No, basically actually it's like I, I use for instance a model of a, of a jaw like uh, that I built with a uh, claw. I see, did you say that claw? I don't remember the term, but uh, it's like I mounted something and then I just see actually how it was moving following the, the quadrate, and I could see that there was a, a lateral displacement by just using this uh, this uh, malt. What we did is that we did indeed perform some geometric morphometric and phylogenetic morphometric, which is a little complex to understand, but basically we use landmarks that we put on the uh, mandible articulation in ventral view. So you have to understand that there is a quadrate. So we are looking at the mandible like this side, like the uh, uh, ventrally, yeah. And so this mandibular articulation always includes two what we call condyles in dinosaurs. And so we put some uh, landmarks on those condyles. And then we did that actually for those quadrates and a large amount of quadrates among uh, pteropods. So from the very basal one to the very derived one. And we use just this technique to see actually if the the mandible the mandible articulation is similar more similar to one that we find in spinosaurus or more uh, like a, if it's more morphologically uh, um, if it if it more uh, it looks like more the one that we find in primitive dinosaurs or more derived one and it's actually another argument saying that actually they belong to spinosaurus because really the the morphology of uh, the mandible articulation is very very similar to uh, other spinosaurs that have been found in, for instance, uh, North Africa, but uh, during another time, Sycomimus, or Europe, Baryonyx, in uh, in England. So it was actually one of the techniques that we use. We use also phylogenetic morphometric analysis, which is actually, it's like you use actually those landmarks that uh, you have positioned it on the mandible in different uh, in different uh, pteropod species and then you try to map that you try to see actually what are those uh, similarities and you map that like if it was a tree and then you see actually if those uh, the morphology makes some what we call clades like a, a monophyletic group and and we see actually that based only on the mandibular articulation we see that actually there are a lot of group of dinosaurs that are resolved that really like correspond to the group that we find uh, among dinosaurs, like I said, spinosaurs, but you have tar tar tyrannosaurids, uh, those are family. And, and so, yeah, so we just use those techniques by, based on landmarks just to prove that we do have a uh, quadrate belonging to spinosaurs. That's great, and um, thank you. And um, so what's next for your research? Oh, I'm actually dealing with the evolution of uh, teeth in pteropod dinosaurs. Uh, that's very interesting because uh, teeth has been lost in uh, in birds, obviously. But you have a very large diversity of uh, teeth among this group of uh, mostly carnivorous dinosaurs. At least they are usually uh, defined that way. It's like pteropods are those meat-eating dinosaurs. But we do know that actually a large majority of pteropod dinosaurs were herbivores or omnivores, and their the morphology of their teeth is very, very is completely different from what we call the xiphalon one, the blade-shaped tooth that you find in uh, T-Rex, for instance, or Velociraptor. So there's one thing, and then I also investigate in the same way, the evolution of teeth in some cousins of the ancestor of mammals that we call gomphonont. They have a very strange teeth. They, they, they were living in the Triassic period, like at the very beginning of the, uh, the time of uh, dinosaurs and pteropods. And uh, and then they got, unfortunately, they got extinct actually at the end of the Triassic, which was not the case of, uh, uh, of dinosaurs that could actually expand after that extinction. But they were actually uh, the cousins of the ancestor of mammals. They were not exactly mammals, but they are very closely related to mammals. And so, yeah, they have a very strange teeth and I'm trying to understand how did evolve 
throughout the, the Triassic before they got extinct at the end of the Triassic. That sounds really interesting. Looking forward to reading those papers. Um, uh, thank you very much. Thanks again for joining us. Um, I'll we'll put the link below this um, to the paper. Um, thank okay. you again. Of my pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.